Good music this morning. Real good music. I like it. I like it. I like it. What's up, everybody? And uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to another epic live stream of how to build a bass guitar in SolidWorks using photos. It's always all about using the photos. Everything we've been doing throughout this stream, uh, the common theme has been how to use photos to get the desired results out of your 3D CAD system. Uh, I do a lot of this, taking photos of my parts and using those photos to drive the design. And we're gonna continue doing it today. Uh, what I have done today is uh, set us up with some photos from the output or the yeah the output jack of the instrument. So this is the output jack looking in from the side. This is the output jack looking in from the front. This is a bad picture here. Uh, you can see here that it's not quite looking straight down uh, the output jack. It's like a little bit off kilter and, and that's not going to really help us that much. So took a second photo and that gets us, you know, more in the, in the right ballpark. So what we're going to see here is that although we won't use the this photo for, you know, necessarily the entire design, it's a lot easier to go into SolidWorks and to create a line and then create an arc and then create a line and then create you know an angled line and an arc and an angle line. it's a lot easier to go in and kind of trace this shape and then use the caliper to get the uh precise dimensions at key locations than it is to just measure this part and you know kind of hope that you end up with the right shape and that's where you can really get a lot of value uh you know, from working with photos and using those photos to help drive your design. Lighting Denny in the chat says, use them all the time, either from phone or scanning on flatbed scanner. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And you know, in the future, we can get into discussions of uh, like a, what it's called, photo photolemetry or uh, using like a 3D scanner or using your phone as a 3D scanner and going around the model and generating or picking up an older 3D scanner online. You know, they're, they're less than $1,000 uh, at this point for something that can get you kind of a quality output. And so that certainly is a path that you can go down. It just depends on what your job is uh, and whether or not uh, that type of uh, an investment is really worth it. You know, a lot of the stuff that I make for around the house uh, will be like little 3D printed parts that need to fit onto other components, components that have strange shapes, uh, or maybe I'm repairing something that broke halfway through. And so uh, I need to take a picture of the break and the break is a very strange line. And then I'm gonna 3D print something that's gonna couple into that. Well, being able to take photos and use those photos to augment the design process is an incredible time saver and extremely valuable and uh, that's kind of been the theme throughout this live stream series and so I hope that you guys are getting a lot out of that uh, because that's really what I want you to take away from this is just understanding that if you learn how to use photos as part of your design process it can save you so much time and it can just help you with little things like what I mentioned about that output jack which is what we are going to get into today now, before we get into uh, that part of the presentation, I just wanted to, um, as always, review with you a little bit of uh, the changes that have occurred since we left yesterday. And the, the main things that we'll see changing here since we left yesterday are going to be just a little bit of refinement to some of the hardware that we put in on the bridge. You might have seen on social media, I posted an image that looks something like this. Uh, I think that bridge really came out looking great. But I did you know, do some, uh, we'll call them Toby tweaks to give myself the, the best results from this uh, design. And particularly when it comes to any kind of social media or marketing, there's little things that you can do that, that really help with the process. And one of those things is that I will opt to actually create either threads or pseudo thread geometry. So I'll show you an example of each of those. Uh, this model here, I created using actual threads. Now, what you want to remember is the idea of, um, and when I say actual threads, I mean like an actual helical uh, sweep, sweep cut. What you want to remember is that there is gonna be a direct correlation between performance degradation and the number of triangles in your model. And one easy way to visualize this is to export to an STL. 
Uh, so let's say I extrude this into a rectangle that is uh, simply, you know, a four-sided rectangle here. And uh, just give me a second here. I just want to make sure I'm going into the correct directory. I am. And that is what I wanted there. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this and I'm going to save this as an STL. What's up, Ali? Current front runner in the Too Tall Toby Speed Modeling January Challenge. What's up? What's up? What's up? All right. So I'm going to call this STL Export. Uh, this is going to be a, a new folder in the project here. And uh, I'm going to export this brick as an STL. And I'll just call this uh, brick no fillets. And you can see here that when I do that export, it tells me that the number of triangles is 12. And you can also see that I can kind of visualize the number of triangles in that model. So number of triangles is 12, meaning that uh, each face, each of the six faces of the brick is basically split into two triangles. And then that outputs to our STL, uh, typically used in 3D printing. But in this example, we're talking specifically about graphics triangles. Just using this as kind of an example to help you understand the phenomenon of graphics triangles. So now I'm going to add a fillet here, a half inch fillet on each of these four corners. And then I'm going to file save as STL again. And I'll call this one brick corner fillets and now you can see that our, our triangle count jumped from 12 to 492 that is a massive jump and you can see where the increase in triangles is coming from not only on this top face here in the sense that we added two additional triangles in this region but also all the additional triangles here and then the obvious uh, all the additional triangles that are landing here and so this is going to have a direct impact on my graphics card uh, and my graphics performance in SOLIDWORKS or in any 3D CAD system. Let's take this example one step further and add a small fillet around the top edge of this model. File, save as, STL, and save. And now we see that it jumped from four, whatever it was, 492 up to 7,932. And the uh, graphics triangles taking place along this small edge are almost black. Now, that <clears throat> might not seem like that big of a deal to you, uh, but it is a big deal. And I'll tell you why it's a big deal is because sometimes what you're doing is not a brick, but instead is a washer. So let's say that we had a washer here with a uh, major diameter of one and a minor diameter here of 0.375. And we're gonna extrude that out to a height of uh, 90 thou. File, save as, STL. And we're going to call this thing uh, washer. Oops, file, save as, STL. And we'll call this thing washer, no fillets. 1176 triangles all right now we're gonna we're gonna do a rendering and we're gonna say i think this rendering would look a little bit better or i think this part maybe it's not even for a rendering i just think this part would look better if it had fillets on it yeah that looks way more realistic that looks like an actual washer so now we do file save as stl let's see what happens to our 1000 triangles uh, that we had when there was no fillets wow 50,000. <laughs> it's quite the increase in uh, triangle count there just by adding a curve on a curve. And now let's say that we use this washer 50 places in this bass guitar project. Well, we basically just completely tanked our graphics performance in SOLIDWORKS for no reason. And keep in mind, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about your... Uh, uh, ability to export as STL. I'm talking about like you change screens and you have to sit there and wait for the SOLIDWORKS ring or you uh, or the whole screen goes white or it says Windows is not responding. You know, a lot of times these are all rooted back to this this phenomenon where you have one single part that has a lot of graphics triangles that's used over and over and over and over again. And so if we were to examine this uh, this beautiful part that I created here uh, this, you know, this amazing part that I created here and get rid of those threads and do file, save as, and save this as an STL. So we'll call this one, uh, screw, no threads, 3,278. And now let's take a look at it with the threads. And we go STL, screw, 
with threads and save. 60,000. Interestingly, it's not that much more than the washer. Uh, some of that is derived from this area here as well, a very small fillet running around a curve. A curve on a curve is always going to crush your performance. But in this case, I've got 60,000 graphics triangles, um, and then I'm going to take that... I just want to, hold on, before I proceed, just because I'm an engineer uh, and I know that uh, we always want to be technically correct, the export to STL is not the same as graphics triangles. It's just a very close approximation, and it's a good tool to help uh, understand what the impact of certain features are. Uh, the the fact that I had 3,000 graphics triangles and I went to 60,000, uh, sorry, I had 3,000 triangles in STL and I went to 60,000 triangles in STL does not mean that I would go from 3,000 to 60,000 in uh, um, in the application of a graphics triangle, but it does mean that you'll see essentially a 20x increase in the number of graphics triangles if we go from having no threads to having threads. The ratio is what you are able to uh, gain by doing this simple exercise of export to STL. It, it's not a one-to-one. -one. It's not like the number of triangles in STL is the same as the number of graphics triangles because it's dependent on the um, refinement of your STL export as well as the uh, image quality that you're working with in your SOLIDWORKS settings. So it's not a one-to-one, -one, but the, the ratio is often the same. So NLV is in the chat and saying that's why cosmetic threads, uh, instead of actual cut threads, threads are just for illustration purposes and redundant in machining except for 3D printing. Yes, a wonderful comment and very much the point that I'm making here. The point that I'm making here is, generally speaking, you don't want to create helical threads or really any threads um, unless you're doing it for some type of a graphical representation. If you want this if you want this thing to look good when you make a rendering or you want this thing to look good when you uh, are creating some marketing content or some you know digital assembly instructions, then there's probably justification to add the threads. Uh, if you can get away with just using the cosmetic threads with the texture on the surface, then do that. Now, the number of graphics triangles that your computer can can handle before it becomes problematic is going to be dependent on the uh, uh, capability of your computer and of your graphics card. So you might have an assembly that works great on your computer and then you might send it to somebody else and it works uh, very, very slow. You take a huge performance hit and that's because their computer is not as capable as your computer. There is a tool built right into assembly mode called assembly visualization that is very helpful in uh, diagnosing these types of problematic components. And you can go into assembly visualization and you can have your entire feature tree sorted by mass. The parts that are the heaviest will show up at the top of the tree. That's an option that you can do. So you click this option here, this is mass and the heaviest parts will show up at the top of the tree. However, you can change that, uh, that, that um, criteria for sorting by going to this little arrow here and choosing more. And one of the criteria for sorting is graphics triangles. So as we go through and we look at this list here, we can see that one of the criteria for sorting is graphics triangles. And so I am able to say Show me the components which have the highest number of graphics triangles at the top of this list. And it appears that the neck has the highest number of graphics triangles. Well, I can't really do much about that. It's a swoopy, lofty part. There's lots of curves on curves. There's going to be some components that just have a high number of graphics triangles. But you'll notice that the next highest number of graphics triangles, well, is the body. And then the next highest is this spring. And there's four of these springs. Well, is there anything that I can do about that? Do I really need to show the spring? Or could I maybe just show that spring as a, a cylinder or a simplified version of the spring? And then we get into some of these screws. So this screw here, which has the curve on the curve, is you know one of the highest number of graphics triangles in my project. And it is uh, there are four instances of that screw and we're pretty much never going to see it 
Because the body is going to be there preventing anybody from seeing it. Even if I did a rendering, nobody's going to see it. Now, maybe if I did like a dynamic assembly where I wanted to show the screws, you know, being assembled in, then then maybe somebody would see it and get confused. But the point that I'm making here is that there's probably no reason for me to have that helical cut sweep in that part. And if you ever want to determine whether or not you have components that are uh, causing a large degradation in your assembly performance the tool that you can use is found here on the evaluate toolbar it's called assembly visualization and the <coughs> excuse me and that tool is very useful uh, and it is used to help you determine which components have the highest number of graphics triangles so that you can go through and make a, maybe a simplified configuration so you could open up this part now here's another little trick that I use a lot of times is I don't make a simplified configuration, I make a detailed configuration. So I choose here, add configuration. What's up, Krim of Sweden? Welcome to the chat, welcome to the party. So I do add configuration and I make this configuration called fully detailed. Now why do I do that? Why do I make one called fully detailed instead of making one called, um, Oops. instead of making one called uh, simplified. The reason why is because in the assembly here, I'm using, you know, I'm currently using this configuration and I don't want to have to go through the assembly and change everything to the simplified. So I can make this one called fully detailed, which has that cut. And then I could have the simplified version and I could just uh, suppress that feature in the simplified version. And then the assembly is automatically using the simplified version. Okay, so in other words, the assembly is not using the fully detailed version. And if I ever want the fully detailed version, I can come in here and I can change it to the fully detailed version. So that's just a little pro tip, uh, learning how to use the assembly visualization tool and just recognizing that you really don't need a helical cut, like this helical cut here. You really don't need this. Adding that in there, I think, is a mistake. Uh, it is something that I would avoid, and I only really did it here because I wanted to uh, share that lesson with you guys, and because, um, and because I was just having fun with cut sweep. Honestly, sometimes I just get into <laughs> making features uh, and having fun with making these features. A different approach that you could take is to just do a uh, revolve cut. This is this is a part that we took out of the toolbox and we added it to our project and when, then we divorced it from toolbox by removing the toolbox flag. And in these parts that come from toolbox, they have what's called a uh, a simplified or sorry, a, they call it a schematic thread. It's a single cut revolve and then a linear pattern of that cut revolve. Well, personally, I think that looks pretty good and that's a real nice kind of middle ground. If you want people to see that it is threaded. Uh, if you want it to show up graphically and look like it's threaded, this is a great approach to consider. Uh, just make a single cut and then, you know, cut revolve and then do a pattern or, you know, multiple cut revolves, um, whatever. But when we look at that here, especially with that spring going around it, I mean, it looks great. You know, nobody's going to look at that and say, hey, that's not, that's not helical. Uh, it looks great. It looks fine. It's totally representative of what we're trying to show. And similarly with the, uh, uh, set screw that's going through here in the strut in the saddles you can see here that once again that is a cut revolve and a linear pattern of that cut revolve looks great anybody who sees that is going to say that's a threaded set screw um, and that's what you're going for if you choose to include that level of detail otherwise uh, like Ali said you can always just use the texture on the surface that looks like it's threaded and that's what we're seeing here we're just seeing the texture on the surface that looks like it's threaded and that will use the minimal amount of graphics triangles so a few different options there for you to consider and uh, a few reasons why you might consider using uh, one of those options or you know different options in different places in the project just gonna take a sip of my water here as always, let me know if you have any questions. Uh, if you like water, hit the like button. Uh, the like button really helps with the uh, algorithm in YouTube. So today we're going to get started uh, by creating this sheet metal. It's, it's sheet metal, but I'm not going to create it as sheet metal because it's, uh, it's like drawn and formed. Uh, but we're going to create this little cover here that goes over the instrument jack, and then we are going to create the instrument jack uh, working from photos. And after we create the instrument jack, we are going to uh, 
uh, take a break. And then tonight what I'll do is I'll create some of the other components working from photos. I'll, I'll do that offline tonight. Maybe I'll, uh, maybe I'll record myself doing it so you guys know what I did. But what I mean is um, the instrument jack is part of this harness here. So it's the, the instrument jack. Uh, that's the output. It's this potentiometer, which is volume. Potentiometer here, uh, which is volume. And it is this three-way switch, which controls the uh, single coil, dual coil, or, or blend functionality of the pickup. Um, I don't think you guys need to watch me modeling up these parts. The, they're kind of intricate. But I will do the instrument jack just because I think it shows, uh, again, the value of working from an image. And, uh, and it also, you know, as always, it gives us that kind of debate of how deep should I go as far as assembly uh, functionality? Because technically this is an assembly of several different components, but I'm probably just going to make it as one part, right? Because you're almost never going to purchase like this, this pole, <laughs> you know, you're going to, you're just going to purchase the whole thing as a, a quarter inch TS jack. So we'll get there in just a few minutes, uh, but but for starters, we are going to use this guy. Nice bicycle. When's the next CAD vs. CAD battle? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think the next uh, CAD vs. CAD tournament is going to begin in May or June or July. It's going to begin a little bit earlier this year, uh, give us a little bit more breathing room between matches. And um, we'll have more details about how to qualify for that. If you want to practice against the chat, we do run Model Monday Live every Monday, and that lets you see how fast you are against the rest of the chat. Uh, and that's another great place to practice and to meet some people who are in the community. Ah, yes. Morning coffee. Get us going. Here we go. Uh, we're going to make a new part here. Uh, we're going to continue with this project using the technique that we've been using so far which is the master model layout part technique that means that the very first part in each of our sub assemblies is this part here this is a part that has all of the geometry that we need uh, to create you know the the elements of our design and so we're going to choose top plane begin a sketch orient the view and we're going to take this curve here and convert it and we're going to take this curve here and we are going to offset it and that is going to give us the geometry that we need for the uh, instrument cov cover here so the geometry for the instrument cover is going to show up at a thickness of about 35 thou so we'll offset that to 35 thou 0 0.035 there we go and then we can create some geometry for the uh, width of that thing. I'm just going to make this parallel to the center line of the hole, uh, which is coming from an earlier sketch that we created when we created the hole for that instrument jack. So it should give us something pretty close to what we're looking for. We're going to say that that is at a width of 1.435. There we go. 1.435. And uh, we will use the center line here. Here's kind of a cool trick that you can use if you ever have a center line. You can pick the center line and pick those two lines, and then you can say symmetric, and that will center uh, the lines. So normally, you know, symmetric, you think like I'm gonna have two circles and make them symmetric, but you can also use it as a centering technique. And uh, then we are going to trim here and here using power trim, and that is going to give us the geometry for the instrument jack cover. So then we'll rename that layout dash instrument jack cover and we will right mouse button sketch color and change that sketch color to something that really pops out for us. Let's make that uh, let's make it a yellow. We don't have anything really yellow in here. Yellow doesn't show that good with the black background, but we're going to do it. We're doing it. All right, now here we are in the master, uh, sorry, in the sub assembly for the body, and we're going to choose the command insert component, new part. Just wondering here if I want to do this as a sub assembly because it's got the nut and the. I don't think I'm going to do that. I think I'm just going to do it. Do it all uh, as individual components here. So insert component, new part, and this part will be uh, R 
BG dash. What are we using for the body here? Body subassembly are fours, so I'll call this one uh, 401 dash instrument jack cover. And then this is going to go on the front plane of the assembly because we always start by selecting the front plane of the assembly. Now we're going to immediately exit that sketch and we're going to go to the tree of that part. We're going to take the top plane, hold control and drag down to get a copy of the top plane of that part. And then we are going to select what I really wanted to select was this, uh, this location here. I think, do we have a mid plane for this? I think we do. Um, I'm going to change the way I'm doing this. We created a mid plane for this, right? Right in the middle of the... Oh, we have a plane for the body thickness. Mm. We really should have a mid plane in this thing uh, so that we can locate something. Like really, we should have the location of that hole. Uh, but I think we did locate that hole at the middle. So let's take the uh, body thickness and the top plane, and then S key, uh, reference geometry plane, and we will make a new plane at the, the middle of those two. And this one will be called body mid plane. Okay, once again, creating that in the uh, master model layout so that we can continue to reference it for all of our other components. Uh, so now we can take that body mid plane and we could do S key reference geometry plane and just offset that at zero. Basically just copying that plane, uh, copy of body mid plane. There it is, copy of body mid plane, copy of body mid plane, uh, right in our master, or sorry, right in our new part that we're creating. And then I'm gonna select that copy of body mid plane, begin a sketch, right mouse button on this yellow sketch that we created, select chain, right mouse buttons, Interesting. There's not a select chain there. Oh. Oh, wow. That trim got a little bit funky, huh? Select chain. And this one, convert. Gonna have to go back in there and clean up that trim at some point. Same thing on this side, huh? Okay. And then S key extrude. And we're going to bring that to a mid-plane height of 1.10. It like barely looks like it's covering the, the instrument hole there, huh? Looks like the instrument hole was not created at that same mid-plane location. That's got me a little bit nervous. Let's see what we did with that instrument hole, because that's really where this plane should be. That looks to be on the mid plane, huh? So is the other one somehow not on the mid plane? I mean, obviously it's not. Look at that. It's not a good result. <laughs> I'm going to just reference this to the to this guy, the mid-plane surface for body. For now, we'll come back and re-examine that a little bit later. Now we got our four holes here. Uh, one thing to know about the whole wizard command is that if you put the whole wizard command directly on a surface, you can, uh, you can have the hole go normal to that surface, which is what we want. So this is a hole of 0 0.165 on the surface here. Uh, but what I mean by that is if we select this face so if we pre-select that face and then we go features whole wizard and we just make a basic through hole that's all we really want to do here um, and then use a custom size of 0 0.165 uh, what will happen here is that when we go to positions we're actually working now in a 3d sketch and so that hole ends up being uh, normal to the surface 
So we are able to ensure that that hole is going you know, straight through the geometry as opposed to it going uh, at kind of a weird angle. So I think that's what we'd want. They're probably going to punch those holes first and then form. Um, probably. I mean, I don't know for sure, but probably that's what they're going to do. So that gives us our four holes there. Now, obviously, that is not uh, entirely correct because we need to determine the height location of those holes and we need to determine the... Um, uh, we need to determine some other geometry on this thing. So let's get this guy just a little bit more manageable here. And then we will hide that. And then we will use, just use, we'll just use a simple plane here. So I'll roll back before this and I will use the option for reference geometry plane. And just offset a plane down here to the distance to that whole center. So it looks like about 0 0.13, confirming on the other side, maybe 0 0.135. And we'll do flip offset. There we go. And then we'll do the same thing here. So we'll do reference geometry plane, flip offset, so it's going up like so. And what that does for us is whenever you're working on a 3D sketch, you can take that, that point of the 3D sketch, hold control, pick the plane and make it on plane. So take this point, Hold control, pick the plane, make it on plane. Take this point, hold control, pick the plane, make it on plane. Take this point, hold control, pick the plane, make it on plane. So it's just a different way of defining the points in your 3D sketch, which in this case are the points of our um, whole wizard locations. And then for the final location, we could take this plane here and take this point and just grab a measurement. Um, or you could even pick this edge and then pick this point and get a measurement. Uh, either way, it's, you know, it's going to give us what we want. That looks to be about 0.1, I'll call it 0.165. And we'll do the same thing from the other side. And then we can take, um, interesting that that one's still not fully defined. Maybe I went from. Huh. It's weird I can't drag it anywhere. It's coincident on planes, coincident on that face. It's 0.17 from that side. Same exact thing I did here, but that one's that one's fully defined and the other one isn't. Interesting. That's gonna be a long Y. That's fully defined. That's gonna be a long Y. And okay, now they're all fully defined. Alright. I'll take it. And then for the definition of this, maybe I want to um you know, maybe I just want to find the correct hole size here. 0 0.018. Nope, we're going a little bit bigger here. Man, it's a long list, huh? <laughs> It's a little bit smaller here. Let's say uh, five thirty seconds. Mm. Number twenty. I don't think I've ever used a number twenty. All right, I like it. Now for this final shape of the uh, of the instrument jack cover, um, what we need to do pr probably the best way to do this would be to just do a uh, a loft. So we could cut a hole for the larger diameter and then we can um, determine, like you can see that that kind of gets flat. So it's curved to the top and then it's flat at the at the bottom. So we could just create that geometry and then loft, uh, loft the geometry together. That's probably the easiest way to do that. Um, you could certainly attempt to do it with like a revolved feature, but I don't think you're gonna get the, the results that you're hoping for if you do that. In fact, on that note, it might actually make sense to do this as a surface feature um, and uh, and then basically just thicken it at the end. And I'll show you guys why that is. Um, this is a good another good uh, good kind of trick that that we can take away from this lesson here. So if we I'm going to show this center plane again so that we can reference our circle to it. So if we were to create a new plane, uh, which is going to be uh, Really, we need a plane that's that's perpendicular to this geometry. 
So let's say we were to create a center line here um, and then another line here like this. Make these two perpendicular. Drop this one here on the midpoint. And then take this. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Ambrose Station. Sorry about that. So um, what I did here was I came onto the uh, top, uh, this mid mid plane surface here, uh, created the perpendicular lines. So these are two center lines that are perpendicular and midpoint to one another. And then I'm going to take this line here and make it tangent to that kind of top surface there. And then I could take this point and this point and this line and make those symmetric, kind of like what we talked about earlier. And what that's going to do for us is it's going to leave us with a line that's going right down the middle of that geometry. So this basically is just setting us up to have a location for some planes that we're going to be creating. And so one of those planes is going to be reference geometry plane normal to this curve at this end point. And then one of those planes is going to be normal to this curve at this end point. So normal to this curve at this end point. And what we need to do is edit that sketch so that that endpoint is in the correct location, which appears to be about uh, 0 0.14 from the top. All right, so what that just gave us was, um, so this will be plane for holes upper. Uh, this will be plane for holes lower. Uh, this will be center line layout, right mouse button, sketch color, make that like a magenta, something that really pops. And then this will be uh, plane for uh, large hole cut. And then this will be plane for loft profile one. Okay, so we go through, we rename the tree so that uh, we're leaving ourselves these kind of love notes so we can find these love notes later. And, uh, and then at that point, I probably would also check this into the vault so that we have a record of what we've been doing uh, with this project up to this point or with this feature, this, sorry, with this model up to this point. So this is going to go in at revision one, first version of this part that we are adding into the vault. Uh, Ali says, can you emboss the tool in sheet metal uh, used for that after unflattening? You could almost certainly do this in sheet metal, yeah, using unflattened, using embossed, using the emboss tool. Yeah, I don't think you even... I don't know, maybe you couldn't do it. It would be really tricky with the SOLIDWORKS sheet metal tools, put it that way. Um, you could probably get there, but it just it seems like it'd be a lot more trouble than it's worth in this particular case. Um, a lot of times what I'll tell people is if you have the surface function for flatten, surface flatten, which is available in SOLIDWORKS Premium, then what you would do is you would just design the thing as though it's uh, intended to be sheet metal, meaning all the faces are tangent to one another. And then you can use the surface flatten function to unflatten that part. If you don't have SOLIDWORKS Premium, what you can do is you can look online. There's people that have posted files that have the surface flatten feature in them. And if you can just get a hold of a file, you know, from a, a different user, a user who has Premium, and that file has surface flatten in it, then you can use it in your file. So um, that's that's like the hack. That's the workaround for it. If you don't have Surface Flatten, just find a file that has Surface Flatten in it. People have posted them online in different forms and stuff. And then you can use that to Surface Flatten. And Surface Flatten is kind of like the workaround when you're doing sheet metal with uh, parts that don't play nice with the SolidWorks sheet metal. I'll try and do that in this one uh, at some point. I'll make a video or something about it showing how to do that with the, a downloaded file. So if we did a uh, cut extrude here, so this is, I'm going to show you guys the approach one uh, that, that will probably not be a good approach. And then I'll show you guys approach two, turning this into sheet metal. So for approach one, I'm going to do an extrude cut. And then I'm going to go to the profile plane and I'm going to create a thin feature extrusion at the same uh, wall thickness. So we'll go um, extrude. I forget what the wall thickness was. This is a little trick that I did in one of my power moves. Uh, you always have the measure functionality down here at the at the in the status bar at the very bottom. So if you just click on that edge, it tells you in the status bar uh, what that length is. Move that up a little so you can see it. So the length is zero point 
three six. Is that what we're using for that? Is that what I used for that initial ball six street? Thirty six thou. Whoops. Let me edit sketch and edit feature. Oh, it was from that offset sketch. Huh? All right, whatever. I'll just call it thirty six uh, thou. So, um, so on. This loft command, when we try to loft from here to here, you know, how are we going to do it? Let's say I do this as an extrusion uh, 0 0.036. So now I have an extrusion there that I want to loft to. Well, how am I going to loft those two together? It's going to be a little bit uh, tricky, right? I'm going to have to go to lofted boss base and I'm going to try to take this uh, and loft it. Like even just initially selecting that, it doesn't like that selection. And certainly you can loft from a face to a face. We, we, uh, we did that when we were working with the neck. We created that loft that went from a face to a face. But it just doesn't like this, this process of creating a loft. And so, you know, there's other ways that we could maybe do this. But I think they're all going to present their own challenges and they're all going to be problematic. Uh, and I think instead what we're going to see is that a better solution is just to do this as a surface and then thicken into a solid. Now, the cool thing about surface modeling and solid modeling in SolidWorks is that they're very interchangeable. It's very easy to go from a solid to a surface and then back to a solid. And the way that you do that is with the command insert face delete, insert face delete. And when I go insert face delete and I choose this first option here for delete, then when I pick any face of the model and hit the green check mark, I just turned that body from a solid body into a surface body so we can see here in the tree uh, that we now have a surface body in the tree so we have one solid body which is that puck that's out back that's solid and now we also have a surface body which we can see here this is surface now so what i'm saying is instead of doing uh, uh delete face and just picking that one single face I could rip around this thing and get all these faces and delete them. Now, you know, a different approach would be just to model the thing as a surface from the beginning. You know, do that original extrusion, not as a thick extrusion, but as a surface extrusion. But I think this is a good opportunity to illustrate that we can always turn a solid into a surface, and we can also turn a surface into a solid, in this case using the thicken command. So now I can do the same thing on the back side here. So I could go um, insert face delete. And I can delete here on the back side, get rid of that geometry, and then I can perform a surface loft. So lofted surface that goes from this edge to this edge. Look at that. That's going to work pretty nicely. Not only can I do that, but I can also say that I want this to start with a tangency constraint and end with a tangency constraint. So that actually gives me kind of the filleting that's going on between those two. And I might want to make a little adjustment to just how extreme that tangency constraint is being applied. Um, and this maybe just takes a little bit of iterative examination to determine, you know, what the correct loft geometry would be. But... That looks pretty darn good and much easier than trying to loft from a curved section to a planar section using, you know, and, and with a curved hole using solids. And now I could go to the command thicken. So really in this loft, I think that uh, a little more realistically, this rear section here would have more of a tangency constraint because uh, that's going to be a uh, that's going to be the outside bend where this will have less. less that's going to be the inside bend. So I can do something like that. And then I could go to the command thicken. Oh, sorry, I can go to the command knit and I can knit these three surfaces together. And then I can go to the command thicken and make this the 0 0.036 or whatever we were using for our wall thickness and turn that surface back into a solid so that I can do the final features on that instrument jack. So that's a cool little lesson there on how to go from solids to surfaces to solids. Uh, definitely a good, uh, good little trick to know. Some good little tricks in there to know. Um, again, you know, the other approach might be that you start out here with your copy of the mid plane, and then when you go to do your your boss extrude, let me just take this and convert it, just so you can see it. Instead of converting that entire uh, set of geometry, you would just pick the one single face, and then you would go surfaces extruded surface and you would make that a mid-plane extruded surface. So you could also just start out with surfaces, and then when you're ready to thicken, you could go into the thicken command and turn that into your uh, thickened surface, like so, and now it's a solid. 
bouncing between surfaces and solids very easy in uh in solidworks and in a lot of 3d cad programs but certainly uh in solidworks very easy to bounce between a solid and a surface main solid pleat uh, i'll call this actually main curved pleat so we are not done with this uh because we we did not do any uh diligence as far as trying to get this geometry to be the correct size so let's take a moment and do it correctly so this diameter where the cut is taking place after I'm measuring this after the fillet so uh, ex extending beyond where the fillet is it's gonna have a diameter of about 0.95 and then the uh, location of this boss or the diameter of this boss again inside of the fillets because I'm going to include those fillets those blends as part of the loft inside of that blend inside of those fillets is going to be 0 0.641 a little bit larger than what we uh, what we made uh, when we were doing this. So this will be uh, cut for, uh, I'll just call it cut on curved plate. And then this one will be lower base for hole. And then I'm doing a delete face. So this will be delete face uh, solid to surface curved plate. And then this one will be delete face, solid to surface, lower plate. So anytime you can leave yourself these little love notes in the tree, it just makes it so much easier uh, for when you are re-examining these files later on in life. Now, one last little trick that I'm going to show you here for the surface loft. And we kind of showed this when we did the... Um, uh, when we did the uh, uh, neck is I could use a curve split line command and do an intersection between this plane and this surface. Oh, it looks like it's going to let me do both actually in one shot. And so now I've got two faces here. So face here, face here, and I've got two faces here, face here, face here. And so now when I attempt to loft, let's see what the, if the loft lets me do it with those two faces. So I think I might need to use selection manager here. I'm going to go to selection manager from this and this down to selection manager for this and this. So selection manager is letting me pick. Okay, good. So selection manager let me pick uh, both of those edges in one shot. But what you can see here is that now instead of it just being a loose uh, loft here where I can just assign it anywhere, it's forcing me to connect the loft at those points where the split line took place. And this can be very useful to um, ensuring that your loft is is connecting properly, you know, throughout the entire duration of the loft. Um, just one last thought here on this as we're looking at this thing. Another approach you could maybe take would be to create that as a uh, uh, create that as like a guide curve. So you could maybe consider getting in here with a guide curve depending on how important it is. But I think that that's going to be the approach that I'm going to take. I think that's going to give us a much better result. And just to illustrate that, and I see uh, Bicycle saying, wow, mind blown. Uh, that's good to know, yeah. So just to illustrate that, if we, if we were to create a loft here like this from here to here, you can see that you're getting uh, curvature in the loft. And although it's subtle, um, it is... It is legitimate, you know, like if I show a mesh preview here, you can see that it is a different result. You do get a different result if you have that kind of twisting going on as opposed to going exactly from quadrant to quadrant. So it just depends on how accurate you need the loft to be. But I think in this spot, I am going to use that technique just because I, I like the way it gives me the exact uh, location and I don't end up with any of that twisting. So again, Selection Manager, the point of that tool is that it lets you pick multiple entities in one shot uh, for a loft profile. And then I'll do Selection Manager again and pick multiple entities in one shot for the loft profile. And then for our start end constraints, we're going to say this is going to be tangent to this top face here. And that tangency is going to be maybe a little bit smaller uh, because that is going to be the inside. Oh, no. Uh, 
which way are we offset this dude? Yeah, 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 that's correct. That's going to be the inside bend radius. And then my tangency to face on the bottom here. So basically, as we go all around the bottom face of that loft, the, uh, the tangency is going to take place... You know, all around the bottom of the loft, tangency is going to be to this entire face. As we go around the top of the loft, the tangency is going to be to this entire face. So we'll have a nice tangent blend all the way through the, the entire duration of that loft. So we hit the green check mark. That leaves us with that result. We go to knit surface. We knit these three surfaces together. You'll notice because we have our tangent edges set to hide, that now we don't even see the hard edge between those faces. And then we go to thicken, and we say we're going to thicken this surface back out to our 0.036. And there we go. That gives us uh, the results that we were hoping for. And now finally, we could go back to this surface here, select face, begin to sketch, orient the view, and we can create a hole that is running directly through this thing at a diameter of about 0 0.375. And then we can take that, S key, extrude, cut, right mouse button, through all, right mouse button, reverse direction, right mouse button to finish. And then we have our radii on the corners, which looks to be at about 0 0.1. So we can go here uh, and just make this 0 0.1. Remember, you can pick one corner, and then you can pick all four corners using that connected to loop option. Nice time saver there. Demonstrated masterfully by none other than Ali Yamori in the chat, who submitted an answer to the speed modeling challenge and used that a lot and even got some commentary on it from some of the other runners so check out ali's channel if you want to see that masterful run okay and this one will be called split for loft and this one sometimes there's like an obvious feature like the surface loft that's like that's pretty obvious uh knit all surfaces Thicken to 0 0.036. Always dangerous putting, uh, you know, dimensional values into your um, feature tree because they are not dynamically linked. Instrument jack. And then this will be outer corner fillets. Right mouse button, say plain carbon steel for the material and... I think it's actually probably fine for that um, for that color to remain the same. Right mouse button down at the bottom here. Check in active document. So we now have a version two of that thing. And we can re control tab to return to the assembly. And look at that. It just dropped right into place. How did that happen? Because we were designing that entire part in the context of the assembly. And we were using the geometry of the body to create the location of that instrument jack. So that gives us the instrument jack there. That's looking pretty nice, pretty real. Uh, and we are now ready to create the actual electronics component for that instrument jack as well. Now, while the instrument jack may be manufactured or the instrument jack, uh, really this is the instrument jack cover, while this may be uh, manufactured, uh, the components that go in on the inside are almost certainly going to be purchased. And the reason that I mention that is because it means that we don't have to uh, it, it, it's more of a, an exercise in creating an illustrative element than it is in creating exact geometry. What's up, the Emerja? Welcome, welcome. Good to see you in here. Thanks for joining us. So it's almost uh, it's almost certainly going to be uh, an exercise in an illustrative thing. But guys, what did you think about the uh, instrument jack? cover creation pretty cool approach right turn a solid into a surface turn it back into you know use that so that it's easier to create a loft because when you create a loft with a surface you're only lofting two edges you're not lofting you know potentially four edges so in other words if we were to create a, a loft here between let's say we create something like this thin feature and thin feature and then we do uh, features extrude and we extrude those out as thin feature like so. Okay, now we are going to create a loft that goes between those two thin features. So we pick this face and we pick this face. Well, there's a lot going on uh, with a loft like this. You know, the, the, the wall thickness is going to be thinner. So the, the, um, the wall thickness here, I mean, you can see it graphically, is thicker than the wall thickness here. 
right? Because it's going down on an angle. So that's a problem, certainly. Uh, that's going to be, you know, problematic. Then in the case of that instrument jack thing, it's a curve, you know, that exists on a curve. So you've got this curved hole that exists on a curve, and you're going to have to somehow connect between that with a four-sided object. You know, it's going to be difficult. But if instead you you learn that a different opportunity is to go to the option for um, surface loft, you know, you're going to make your life a lot easier. You're going to make it much easier to... Uh, To just go lofted surface from one edge to another edge and not have all those extra surfaces and then when you're done you can think in that and then you're going to know that it's going to be a uniform wall thickness so if you guys like that be sure to hit the like button if you uh, are running out of shirts in your uh in your wardrobe be sure to check out two tall toby merch you can get this two tall toby shirt uh, be sure to like if you want to uh, send some financial support. There's a lot of different ways you can send financial support. You can use PayPal right on the Tutal Toby site. You can use the uh, Super Chat or Super Thanks if you're watching the recording. So feel free to send some love my way. Uh, financial support is always appreciated and very useful. And, of course, uh, buying a shirt and wearing that shirt out in public is also a great way to show your support for the Tutal Toby live streams. I think that was a pretty cool opportunity to show off some surfacing stuff. Now, let's create the instrument jack itself. So that's this guy here. I still have it on the wire harness because I don't want to unsolder and resolder if I don't need to. And I really don't think that I need to in this case. Uh, we also have the photographs of the instrument jack. So let's get started here. There's going to be a new part in inches. I'm going to go top plane, begin to sketch, orient the view. And I'm going to create a circle with a diameter of the threads on the outside of this thing going up. Uh, let's see here. 0 0.3. Looks like about 0 0.365. And that is going to go up to a depth of about... Well, the, the the depth all the way to the bottom of the uh, of the circuit board is uh, 0 0.330, zero, really. So let's go, let's go, and let's go. Okay, so now we're gonna save this. Uh, this is gonna get saved into RBG. Uh, this is going to be part of the electronics, so I'm going to start a new numbering scheme here in the 500s, uh, and this will be input or output jack. Uh, this will be, I'll just call this TS. It's not, it's only got two poles in it. Um, if it had three poles, it'll be TRS. Tamborore Station says, I bought a shirt, I love it. Barry in the chat. What's up, Barry? He says, do you ship internationally? Absolutely, Barry. Check it out. 2 slash merch. We ship around the world. All right. So RBG, uh, let's call this actually 501. Since we're getting into it. I really feel like the other truck should be 8. So I'm just going to go with that. RBG 801. TS, output jack. Uh, I don't know how to put in a quarter inch without putting in a slash. So I'm just going to put it as TS, output jack and save front plane begin a sketch orient the view and now we are getting into the use of photographs um, so i might go as far as putting in some additional geometry here to help guide the use of the photographs and of course what i mean by that is my envelope dimensions for this thing so the max width when i bring in the photograph is going to be uh well i'm, I'm not going to call it max width i'm going to call it the width at this uh uh, lower I don't even know what this material is it's like a PC board material if you happen to know what it is if you're in the chat this kind of brown material that's on these uh, these wafers I don't know what it is it reminds me of like a PC board material uh, 0 0.6825 for that max width okay wow I'm really struggling with getting this uh, dimension in here there we go I did it <laughs> and then this one is going to be the max height to the, the peak of that uh, instrument jack prong 1.2. It's like it's really like 1.25. Like 1.2485, something like that. Uh, make that coincident. Material could be G30 or G10. All right. Thank you very much, Barry. Appreciate it. Okay. This will be layout envelope for photo. 
and we are going to change the color of that to something like magenta something that really pops out and uh let's check this guy into the vault so we have a version of this in the vault at the current status check an active document just good to have this it's also a copy on a, a di often on a different computer sometimes on the same computer but often on the different computer and so um it gives you a, a backup as well tool sketch tool sketch picture and we will go to this instrument jack from front Oh yeah, look at that photo. I was really, really up in there to get that photo in, in the right spot. All right, let's go get rid of the scale tool and we will resize this manually. Full image is gonna have a little bit of transparency to make it easier to see. And we're gonna resize this just to make this a little bit easier to work with. I like this song too. You guys can hear the music okay? That was sort of a question. Strange way to ask a question, I know. <laughs> All right. Here we go. So I measured it to that bottom G30 wafer. And that's pretty much spot on with what I got from my measurements. So uh, very little deformation in this photo. And that certainly is going to give me what I need to help establish heights and things like that. Remember, this is more or less illustrative. You want someone to look at this and know that it's the instrument jack, but we're not going to be manufacturing this. We're not going to be CNC anything on this photo. So uh, we don't have to worry about uh, that element of it. I'm going to take this layout photo uh, envelope for photo. I'm going to control C. I'm going to go to the right plane and uh, control V this onto the right plane so that I just have a, another copy of uh, this. I'll just call this one layout envelope uh, from side. And uh, this will be dropped right on the origin here. It's more or less a circular part, so this will this will work fine. Uh, this one will be called image uh, from front. This is the, this is the, the only images in this thing are of the instrument jack, so I don't have to worry. Uh, I'm dragging this bar here because of how the um, because of how this the, I've got this thing scrolled over here. And you notice you have the scroll bar down at the bottom. I mentioned this a couple of times during the live stream, but I'll just keep mentioning it because I'm going to keep doing it. Uh, and the reason essentially for that is because the display state is showing up here at the very top of the feature tree. If I didn't have that shown, then I wouldn't end up with the scroll bar here uh, when I, you know, when I can see everything in the in the in the tree here. So I, you know, I call this one envelope from side. Uh, I can see everything. I don't need this scroll bar. Why do I have the scroll bar? Well, you can right mouse button at the top of the tree and say tree display. Don't show display state names. And now that also gets rid of the scroll bar and helps you avoid that uh, kind of annoying functionality. Right plane, begin a sketch, point the view, tools, sketch tools, sketch picture. You know, if you're using this tool enough, you should just add it to your S key so you can easily access the tool whenever you need it. Let's get rid of the scale tool so that we can grab this from the corner to resize it. There we go. Make this 90 degrees for the rotation. Change the um, transparency to be full image. Makes it just a little bit easier to see what's going on behind the image. And we can drop that into place. Like so. And again, what are we using this for? Well, I mean, we're using the whole thing for illustrative purposes. But specifically, we're using this view just to help make it a lot easier to uh, create this prong that's sticking up here. You know, to create these prongs here. It just makes it so much easier when you kind of uh, know what the uh, the shape is that you're aiming for. Now, again, this is a this is an assembly. So you're going to have to decide if you, you know, you're going to have to decide what you want to do as far as um, uh, as far as. Let me think of how to say this. 
making this as a multi-body or making it as an assembly, a true assembly, you know, that's going to be a decision you're going to have to make. It's it's an illustrative part that we're going to be purchasing off or, or grabbing off the shelf. So personally, I don't think you need to put too much time into thinking about, you know, uh, uh, making it a multi-body or making a single part or anything like that. Just like start blasting through this thing. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, the one thing I, I can't remember was if I took that dimension to... That thick spot there, 0 0.2725, or if I took it all the way to the top there. I thought I took it all the way to the top there, so. Yeah, I did. I took it all the way to the top there. Okay, that's what I got for that one. All right, cool. So I think it's just this image here that maybe I want to look at. 0 0.275. Okay, yeah. No, no, that's good, too. Okay, yeah, I'm good. All right, cool. So now... You know, whether you do this as part of your layout or um, whether you do it as a, a, an additional sketch, um, now what you can do is you can start laying out kind of the, the location of some of these key elements of the design. So, you know, the cool thing about having the images in there is that you can use the layout that we created to size the image, and then you can use the image to help with the layout. Like it's kind of cool. There's not a deep uh, a feature dependency in the tree or chronologic dependency in the tree. So in other words, when I what I did first was I created this sketch here, which was the layout for the image. Then I brought the image in and I dropped it onto that layout. Now I can use that same sketch, the layout, and create the location of some of these other uh, revolved features in the layout. Um, and uh, and you know I'm not dependent on the. Uh, uh, I'm not dependent on the location of the image. In other words, I can bring the image back in time. So I could create, you know, a height here to this. And it really doesn't matter what that height is. It's it's just dependent on the image itself. But now this is giving me a layout for a revolve feature. And I can certainly uh, take some dimensions as I'm going through here to make sure that I'm getting the, uh, you know, the correct height. Like, what is the height to this, this lower um, washer? type geometry it's 0 0.33 okay so you know I can change this one here 0 0.33 if it was slightly off um, I can use the center line that I created here along with this just to give myself a slight gap when I do multi-body uh, whenever you have a gap between your components and multi-body it just makes things a little bit easier and again I really don't have to worry too much about the dimensioning here uh, I just need to get it to look the way it looks in the image so you can have that one come across as well and then this next kind of washer shape just kind of eyeballing this thing up here you know, basically it's going to be the same thing create a rectangle and then put in the dimensions of that rectangle you could even make this vertical or collinear you could have small gap here you could even leave it underdefined i mean you really don't have to even go this far you could just leave it underdefined if you wanted to. I don't really like leaving my sketches underdefined. As you know, if you've ever heard my song about sketching, uh, I don't personally roll like that usually, but sometimes you know, there's always exceptions. Okay, so now I can exit that layout sketch and I can go front plane, begin a sketch, select chain. So like this guy here, convert entities, make this guy for construction, and then features revolve. And because there's a gap, I'm going to get into multi-body here, which is very useful. Um, it also lets you easily change colors uh, per body, so you can make things look a little bit different. Front plane, begin a sketch, right mouse button, select chain, uh, convert entities, and take this guy and convert and turn this into a four construction line, and then features revolve again. So just kind of using that layout sketch to drive all of my other geometry here leaving us with you know ultimately what's going to be the shape of this thing so now we're going to get into that uh, g30 wafer i'm just going to call it that from now on uh barry so appreciate you telling me that that's what's called and hopefully that is correct uh, and so, again, I mean, how much you want to include in your layout is up to you. I usually try to include as much as I can in the layout uh, just because of this workflow that I'm showing you. I just think it makes it really easy. And I'll just put a very subtle gap between these just so that I don't get automatic merging. It's the only reason I'm putting a gap in there. And the, uh, you know, the ID 
it doesn't, uh, it's not going to affect my overall design, so I can continue making that collinear as long as that uh, instrument jack can pass through that whole thing. And so then I could go to front plane, begin a sketch, right mouse button, select chain, and hold control and pick this and convert and make this for construction and features revolve. And then we could maybe even start getting in here and uh, adding, you know, adding colors to this. So we could say like the whole thing is going to be plain carbon steel. But the um, when we get to this wafer here, that's going to be a different appearance. And so we could go to sometimes there's some organic stuff that might actually look good on here. Um, sometimes the uh, there's like the the wax. I think there might be is that in plastics here. Yeah, wax. Like one of these might look good on that wafer. And then you would say, I only want that to be applied to that body. And then for these ones here, you could just use different types of metal, like just subtle differences in the metal. Um, you can make this one a polished aluminum, for example, for that body. You can make this one a chrome, uh, let's say like a, a matte chrome for that body. You're just trying to create little subtle differences so that if you do look at this part in a rendering, it looks, you know, it looks tight. Always, There's always a lot more that we can do. Like if you have your... Um, uh, if you have your photo editing software up and you go to the eyedropper, that lets you pick a color from the photo, and then that would give you the RGB and the hex for that color, and then you could take that and you could program that into SolidWorks so that you'd have the exact same color in SolidWorks as you have here. We did that a little earlier when we were looking at the red paint for the uh, for the base body. So, you know, there's always uh, advanced moves you can use to... to get a more realistic view but that basically is going to move us up to the creation of this first uh prong so the the way that this prong works is well the instrument jack itself has uh uh two poles on it there's a wireless transmitter that i have uh, so an instrument cable is going to have these two poles on it. So it'll have the, the lower pole here, and then it'll have the upper pole here on the tip. And so when that goes into the, uh, the output jack, you know, you're going to have one of those poles touching at that tip. So you see, it's, you know, it's, it's just a two pole. It's kind of like a headphone jack, but a headphone jack usually has three poles. That's called a TRS jack. It's just called a two, uh, a TS jack because it just has the two. So this prong is touching here, and and then that comes off of this red cable here. So this this pole that's sticking up here that has the red uh, cable soldered to it, that is all the same piece as this prong here that's sticking up. It's all one and the same. Um, and then this lower section of the of the instrument cable is touching a piece of metal that's touching this black pole here and that's you can actually see it all touching there Let's see if it gets into focus very slow <laughs> uh, Richard I like the way this me uh, this message is getting flagged by YouTube like this is very offensive he says hi everyone don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs> there you go. Flagged by YouTube. I'm going to let that one go through. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. And hello. And yes, please, please like and please subscribe uh, and enjoy this content. Anyhow, um, it's not coming into focus, but now you guys get the point of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to create this two pole system. Uh, again, it is all illustrative, so it really does not matter if it is a uh, thousand percent accurate. But I will say that this little piece that's sticking up here, uh, whoops, let me go back to SolidWorks. This little piece that's sticking up here is also part of that same system. So having the photos is extremely helpful. We can see that this little piece here that's sticking up and this piece here that's going to the red and this main piece that's sticking up here, those are all part of the same piece of metal. And so I'm gonna make them all part of the same body and I'm gonna start out uh, creating that body again, just doing a revolve, doing a simple uh, rotate to get that revolve and working from the layout sketch to get the location of that rotate. So I'll go in here. Uh, maybe I'll make this wafer just a little bit thinner. Oops. Just to give me a little bit more room to, to navigate there. And then I will create another rectangle here. Um, 
This side actually gives me a better view of it, so I could create it over here. And this will be 0 0.003, just 3 thou uh, clearance. And then the wall thickness of this one, again, it really doesn't matter. I'm just trying to illustrate what this thing is going to look like when I revolve it. I think that looks pretty good there. Exit that sketch, and I can say that this is going to be uh, front, front plane, begin a sketch, orient the view, right mouse button, select chain, hold control, pick this guy here, convert, turn this into a construction line, and features revolve. Okay, and it's not going to merge, I hope. Should end up with a bunch of different... Yep, it did not merge. Okay, excellent. So now, kind of something cool that you can do is you can... Uh, Barry says you can also change the material for individual bodies. Yep, that's very true. Very good point, Barry. Um, and another thing kind of cool that you can do here is you can hide all the bodies that you don't want to work with. Now, what I mean by that... Um, let's go to hide our sketches first. What I mean by that is if I go to front plane, begin a sketch, orient my view, and sketch a rectangle that looks like this, and I say features, extruded, boss base... Uh, mid plane so you can see here I'm creating a rectangle and then I say merge bodies so I check the option here for merge uh, sorry merge result which means that the geometry of the wait hold on let me let me move this a little more into place so you can see this when I zoom in the new geometry that I'm creating which is this rectangular extrusion is going to merge to uh, to the other bodies that are in my design. Well, which bodies is it going to merge to? It's going to auto select for that merge. So this option here that says merge results ties directly into feature scope. In fact, if you uncheck merge results, you'll see the feature scope goes away in the property manager. So the option for uh, uh, merge results and feature scope are directly tied to one another. And so it's saying when I uh, boss extrude this, it's going to merge to uh, a specific body and you can control which bodies it will merge to by unchecking auto select so I could say I only want this to merge to this body and this body but not to the other two uh, but in this case I'm going to leave auto select turn on I'm going to hit the green check mark and we end up with one single body in the tree uh, there's an option here in your SolidWorks options for how the tree will display uh, feature manager and we're going to set our solid bodies to always show so we've got one single solid body in the tree. If I roll back before that feature, there are five solid bodies. I roll forward, and because I did auto merge and it merged to everything, uh, SolidWorks, you know, merged just to those bodies. Well, the cool thing about uh, auto select is that it is dependent on hide show state of the body. So that means if I were to take this and this and this and this and hide them, so now those bodies are hidden. And then I take this rectangle that I created and I do extrude mid plane. And I say I want to uh, feature scope, merge results, and auto select which bodies to merge to. When I hit the green check mark here, you'll notice that I still have five solid bodies. Pretty cool, right? If you guys like that, be sure to hit the like button. But pretty cool that you can, uh, you can create a dependency between hide show state of your bodies and the auto merge results. And the reason that's so cool is because what we're gonna do now is we're gonna do some work on this section of the design and we don't want that work to affect the other sections of the design that we've already worked on. So now we can freely create the geometry for this pole that's sticking up without having to worry about, you know, am I gonna accidentally merge to the other bodies? Yeah, no problem. We're not gonna merge to the other bodies. We're gonna be golden. Select the face, begin a sketch, orient the view. Uh, I should be maybe a little bit more uh, aware of what I made the thickness of this, just so I can get uniform thickness throughout all of them. And I'll also measure what the thickness is on the physical part. So measuring here, the thickness on that pole is about 30 thou. So let's make that section of the layout 30 thou. And then we can uh, create a sketch on the right plane that'll merge right into that. So we'll go uh, right plane, begin a sketch, orient the view, and we will start with a line here. That's just a very short line here. And then we will go into a tangent arc. And then another line that comes up here, which should be tangent, but is not quite tangent. Uh, just because I didn't draw it correctly. Uh, a line that comes around to vertical, a line that comes down to here, another tangent arc, another line here like so, 
another tangent arc, and a final line here, like so. And I don't use fix very often, but this is definitely a spot where I would use fix. Uh, so I would take this endpoint here and fix it. I would take this endpoint here, move it around, and fix it. Right? And why am I using fix here? Because this is an illustrative part. It's not a part that I'm going to be purchasing. Uh, I can go back in later and fully define it if, I, if it, you know, if there was like a custom job where I needed to create my own instrument output jacks. You know, I could always go back and uh, and custom define this stuff but i really don't need to in this in this application so um you know and then i can also float that if i need to move this down like if i if i was able to get a good measurement on what that radius is actually supposed to be you know i could move this around a little bit and give myself the best possible results get this line up to here looks like that should actually be maybe a little bit whatever <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend too much time making this perfect it doesn't need to be it just needs to be someone needs to look at it and say yep that's an instrument jack and then of course after I say that I spend another few clicks uh, lining up some more of this geometry okay and again it could be helpful if you just put some dimensions on this thing just to kind of get it close oh it looks like this actually i mean is it vertical isn't it vertical it doesn't matter it doesn't matter we're just trying to get this close just want it to look right take this guy here fix it fix the arc that looks good that looks good this is supposed to be tangent okay good s key extrude it's a thin feature so the thin feature is going to be uh 0 0.035 I actually messed this up. Hold on a second, guys. I messed up the sketch. Forgot something with the sketch. Uh, let's go back to our previous here. Whoa, Robert. I like that. Those boards are called... I can't even say that word. Phenelic board material. Cool. Thank you. Phenelic board material. And I just created a little bit of extra geometry here because I was directly on tangent. That was the change that I made. So now this is 0 0.035, and that's going to go to the inside. And then this is going to be to a width of... Quarter inch. And that will be mid-plane. And in this spot, we can say we do want to merge the result and auto-select because we're only showing one single body there is that supposed to be 30,000 I think I made I think I was supposed to do that as 30 not 35 yeah at a feature 0 0.030 there we go okay that looks good um of course this might be a spot where you would want to go to tools equations manage equations and then you could create a global variable here called um uh bent jack bent jack thickness and then you could say that, that has a value of 0 0.030 and the reason you would do that is because then when you are in here working on the extrusion when you get in here to the thickness feature you could say equals global variable bent jack thickness and when you are creating the layout sketch and you're creating geometry for that dimension you could type in here equals global variable bent jack thickness so if you've got several different dimensions that all need to have the same uh, value you could you could certainly consider getting into equations of course like anything equations is going to add its own new level of complexity that you may or may not want to deal with uh, but uh, certainly it is an option there uh, so this would be uh, bent jack really it's like the posi pole I'll just call it posi pole base and then this will be called uh, posi pole bent jack area and uh, always good when you're working through a design to do check an active document to make a snapshot of that model at that point in time. So I just did a, ch a check in and got myself a revision too. And now the uh, location of this positive pole from the top view looking down is gonna need to be 
uh, determined and established. And then also from looking in from the side on the other side, there's a little bit of a an area that is kind of like sticking out and flat. So I'm referring to this area here. There's like a little uh, section that bends up and uh, ends up flat. And this will just be the exact same thing we did on the other side. Just a, a sh very short section here that's straight. A little section that gets bent up. That's pretty much it. It's really just like what you see there. A little section that gets bent up like that. And, uh... And then another little section that goes in so that it'll merge because I have that tangency. I don't want to end up with a zero thickness extrude. Uh, this will be the wall thickness will equal global property bent jack thickness. And then the depth of this extrusion will be... This one is closer to 0 0.2. Really 0 0.19. And we'll go... Mid plane on that one and reverse that thickness. Okay, that looks good there. Uh, there's just like a little section that's kind of sticking out. And then finally that pole that's sticking out. Uh, we may want to go to a top view for this. So top plane, begin to sketch, orient the view, and then go to our uh, tools, sketch tools, sketch picture. And bring in a picture of this jack looking down from the top. We did take a, a final picture of this thing looking down from the top, so enable scale tool, we'll turn that off. And we will bring this guy like so. Yeah, Chris Castle in the chat. What's up, what's up, what's up? Welcome. Should probably show that wafer, huh? That wafer would probably be helpful. I mean, I can see this thing sticking up here, but... This is also a spot where when you're trying to resize these things, you can change your view style here to wireframe, and that way you can still see the... You can see both. You can see the image and the... Uh, SolidWorks model. Otherwise, you run into those challenges like what I was just running into there where you can't really see through. See, it doesn't look right, but that could easily just be the, um, uh, like a distortion in how I took the photo, because I took the photo from an angle. So if you turn off that use aspect ratio, you can stretch it and then uh, get yourself a little bit closer. And again, really what I'm trying to establish here is where is this section here that's sticking out for that pole. Once I have that, then I'll be able to uh, create the geometry for the pole. So I could just, you know, use this as is and then create a sketch uh, coming kind of out at that angle uh, to get the location of that pole. So in other words, I could just create a simple flat section here from that pole that kind of does one of these. I'd say that's good enough because it's illustrative. It's not, this doesn't have to be uh, manufactured. We're not manufacturing this in-house, so. You just gotta keep these kinds of things in mind, especially if you're doing work for a client uh, you want to try to minimize the hours with that client. I don't know, some of you guys might want to maximize those hours with the client, but uh, I always try to minimize the hours with the client. I don't want to take any more time than necessary uh, so that we can, you know, keep the project moving forward. So, okay, so something like that gets me the basic angle. Um, I could also drop in uh, a little bit more of an explicit angle here so that when I make the pole on the other side, I can see if there's any consistency. So I can maybe, for example, make that 65 degrees and see if there's any consistency when I go to make that pole on the other side. Uh, I think there's a lot of distortion on this image because I'm not showing the wafer uh, that is above that. So let's see here. Yeah, see, I'm only seeing this from the bottom. Uh, and there's another wafer that's above that that actually sticks out a little bit further. Uh, so, you know, I could maybe show this and then take that image and resize it some more to try and get it closer to that, you know, the size of that lower wafer. Something like this. I just can't see that lower wafer all around on this view. So it's probably pretty close to that.
Yeah, it's probably pretty close to that. I'm just surprised by the, the deviation in the uh, the width of that pole. Like, I'm measuring that pole here at closer to like 0.19 or 0 0.205 maybe. My second pass through here. Sometimes I'll take a... Oh, here we go. That's why. Typed in the dimension wrong. That explains it. There we go. Everything fixed. <laughs> Sometimes that's how it goes. Okay, and then I can uh, come in here to this view. Uh, I'm going to actually hide the wafer. And I'm going to extrude that sketch. And the depth of that sketch is going to be equal to the global variable for the bent jack thickness. So that I have a uniform thickness there on that one. And then I'll take that face, uh, begin to sketch, or yet my view. And once again, do what we've been doing, uh, which is to say that I will just create a small straight section, a radius of some sort, and then attempt to approximate the angle of that uh, pole and the height of that pole based on the photo. It's all the more you need to do. You don't need to go too crazy. If you want there to be consistency between the two poles, you could throw in an angular dimension here. Uh, but you want to remember that these things bend all the time in, in uh, actual application. So again, it really is not that important. Uh, we can then take that and extrude it. And this is going to go up to this point here for the depth of the extrusion. And then the wall thickness is going to be equal to the global variable for the bent jack thickness. And now that is going to have some curvature applied to it. And it's also going to get a little bit of a notch out of the, the lower section. So the curvature here uh, could just be a full round fillet. You go full round fillet and you could say I want to use this face and this face and this face. And then the notch out is going to be... Something like this. And that will be mirrored. And then there's going to be a hole up here for the wire to pass through. Uh, is that centered on that thing? Yeah, it looks like it's centered. And so now all of that is going to be cut extrude. And that's going to go up to surface on this surface here. Uh, and this at the tip has a tiny bit of filleting as well. Not, not very large. And that is a pretty nice little uh, pole there. I guess this one on the front has a little bit of filleting too. Very small. And again, we're not going to see this thing. So it's like, well, how much do we really want to put into as far as detailing this goes? It's, uh, it's going to be inside of the bass guitar. You know, this would definitely be a part we'd want to make a simplified configuration for. Uh, but uh, in this case, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to stick, stick with the plan here. So all this stuff that I just created is all going to go into a folder. That'll be called the uh, Posi Poll Features. And then uh, this whole thing, oh, uh, actually let's show the other bodies. Very much starting to come together. I'm liking it. I'm liking it. Uh, this whole thing is going to be... Uh, you know what? Some of these other ones are going to have actually a smaller diameter. I'll circle back to that in a little bit. Check in this active document. Do we have a record of it? Always good to have a record of the work that we're doing here. And let's keep going. We've come this far. Ain't no stopping now. This should probably be not collinear down here. This should be in a little bit. It should be whatever the diameter is of the, uh, the instrument cable, which is about 0 0.25. And then this 
this should probably be the same. Maybe a little bit more of a gap on that one, right? Because we want to jump that one just to get the pole. Okay, yeah, I like that more. And then we got another wafer. So let's go, let's keep going here. Uh, we could go to our wireframe view here to get the geometry for that wafer. Uh, we could say that that one is going to be sticking out a lot more, and then we can notch. We can create some notches for the uh, for the um, other elements that are sticking through that. We'll go back to our kind of tight fit here. And we'll make this just a very small gap so that we don't in inadvertently merge the bodies. Maybe a little sanity dimension here. We'll go from the base to the top of that wafer and we'll see what that uh, distance is. Make sure that we're at least close to uh, what we are expecting to see there. Easier said than done. Do this as like a depth gauge, I guess. Yeah, it's pretty much spot on. Just call it a half inch. That's pretty darn close. Um, actually, you know what? Let's do... Let's do this distance as well as a... Uh, it's just a wafer. Okay, that's good. And we will do a... Front plane, begin a sketch, orient our view. And we'll take that chain and this center line here and convert entities. And we will construction line that and then do our revolve of that wafer of the phenolic board material. And here's kind of a, a little gem that I actually didn't know about until this week. Uh, we can take the material here, we can select this material and do a control shift C, and then we can click on this face and we can paste that material to that body. So control shift a oh, crud. I should have not merged the results there because <laughs> it's uh, sticking in with the tolerance. I gotta add those clearances. Okay, so this was a fail. Copy appearance, paste appearance on the body, and then take this body here, control shift C, and then this body here, we can do a paste appearance on the body. So you can you can use control shift C to grab the material from one face and then when you go to pick you'll be able to, it adds it to your SOLIDWORKS clipboard essentially so you can paste it onto another face so kind of a cool little gem one that I did not know about <laughs> okay this is interesting this uh, cut pattern just seems like it goes all the way around in six places essentially or close to it so Let's see what we got here. Select face, begin a sketch, orient the view. And does that pattern notch in at all? Or is it just flat? What's our image from the top show us? Select face, begin a sketch, orient our view. And that looks pretty straight. Looks pretty straight to me. So we'll just do something like this. Select midpoint. Get that coincident to the center of our design. Give ourselves a little bit of extra room. Bring that in like so. S key, extrude cut. That'll go up to next. I'll do it up to surface. Just to make sure that I stay. You gotta be a little bit, a uh, little bit more aware when you're doing multi-body. You wanna make sure we only cut this one. And I'll hide these other bodies in a minute. I just wanted to make sure that when I do this pattern that it looks good. So we'll do circular pattern of that cut extrude around this edge. Oh yeah, I'd say that looks real good. I don't think there's an instance here. So I think I'll just do uh, instances to skip here.
interesting that that hijacked the color. <laughs> Even though I didn't, you know, the circular pattern's not cutting into those bodies. Very interesting. And then, um, let's see. I could just make the width bigger on all of them, or I could... Let's see here. Or I could just make the width bigger on this last one here. I think it's just that last one. So for that last one there, I'll use a move face uh, instead of a, uh, you know, instead of adjusting that dimension. So this guy can get, well, let's see what the distance is. So from here to here is 0 0.02. So if I offset that 0 0.03, that should give me pretty good results. So we'll go insert face move and we'll offset this face and this face 0 0.03 and we'll do a flip direction to get them in the right direction and that way if we show that again yeah that's that's a winner right there I gotta say that is a winner that's pretty much exactly what that wafer looks like cool all right so that takes care of that wafer uh, we could again add to a new folder here if we wanted to we call this one wafer upper features and then our final thing, our final element of this design is just that final pole. And maybe there's like a little cap there that goes on top of it. Um, and I think that one we could probably draw in from the top view. Uh, so we might, I mean, I like the approach we've been using, but I think we're gonna just do this one by S key reference geometry plane and we'll offset this one 0 0.003 and then we will select that face begin to sketch orient the view and this one will have a diameter here of 0 0.25 to capture that uh, inside pole of the instrument cable and then we are going to show our sketches again maybe change this thing to wireframe and basically hide really hide everything that we created up to this point and that will set us up to create this shape it's kind of like a teardrop shape so we come around there with something like this we could probably get save ourselves a little bit of trouble if we were to create a little flat spot here what's up raju welcome welcome thanks for joining us today could probably save ourselves a little bit of heartache if we were to create something like this little flat spot on there We'll go from the center to the midpoint of this, and we'll make sure that these are perpendicular, and these are perpendicular, and these are perpendicular. And get those to be parallel, okay? It's like the Millennium Falcon. Let's take this line, get it into place, and then fix it. Fix! And we'll make this tangent and we will drag this radius until it looks close enough to pass a brief visual inspection that's the that's the crit criteria we're working from here um, I guess this should be symmetric as well or not <laughs> all right we're not gonna make that symmetric and then this section over here has the other poles sticking up. So, and it, it's kind of like bending right off of the top of that. It's a little bit different from the other one. Uh, I think I'll just end up, I think I'm probably just gonna end up doing a cut extrude in that section. It set me up to, to create that pole uh, that's sticking up there, so. I just kind of want this to be a little closer to there yeah. okay uh, so now we can do s key extrude and we can take that whole shape up to a thickness of is that gonna be the same let's see about the same uh, maybe a little bit thinner you'd think they would be the same I'm gonna make it the same. I'm just gonna use the same global variable. I can make them both slightly thinner and everything should update correctly. So same global variable here. 
and everything else is currently hidden, so I don't have to worry about it merging inadvertently. And because I created this little flat spot here, I can use that face to begin a sketch. And then I can just create a little sketch of uh, this section here, kind of curving down like so, which it does. And then extrude that with a thickness here that is equal to our global variable. And then uh, with a depth of up to vertex, and that's going to go up to this vertex here. And flip the direction of that thin feature. There we go. There's just like a little section there that kind of like sticks over the side. Um, and then on this other side here, like I said, I'll probably uh, just create a cut extrude. So I'll create a, a simple you know, a shape that comes in like this, comes across, and then comes out. And we'll we'll do the same thing we did on the other end where we try to make that all perpendicular. We can get a basic dimension off of this to um, make sure that we're close. And again, it should probably be the same as what the other one was, right? So, let's see. Yeah, 0 0.20. And that works. Guess we want just trying to think here. Uh, I want there to be a very slight flat spot there, so I have something to draw on. That's why I'm kind of pausing here. So I think I'm gonna do center line like this and make that parallel. And then I'm gonna do a slight like a five thou offset there. And that way I can make those coincident. Make it a little bit more consistent. S key extrude cut. This is going to go up to surface here. Gives me that little notch. And then on that notch, I can select face, begin to sketch, orient to view. And create the... Little line here sticking out the arc, and then that vertical segment that goes up to the height of this pole and has the approximate same angle. And of course, we could define that angle so that it's consistent and get that height pretty close, and then we can extrude that with a wall thickness which is equal to our global variable for bent jack and then this will go up to vertex and it'll go up to the other end of that little notch that I created. Now we got our fillet. We'll do this one again as a full round. So pick one face, right mouse button, pick the next face, right mouse button. That was a face fillet, not a full round fillet. Try it again. So pick one face, right mouse button, pick the next face, right mouse button, pick the final face, right mouse button. And there we go. That gives us that pole. That one doesn't have those same notches. Uh, so at that point, I can just get in there and add in that hole. Select face, begin a sketch, orient the view. And extrude cut that right through to this face. And wow, that's pretty much it. That that's epic. That works. Show that. Get rid of that uh, other picture that we showed. What did I what did I do there? I brought in that one. Okay, there we go. Okay. That's uh instrument jack. That definitely uh, will pass uh, as far as uh, if anybody was to see that and wonder what that is, they're going to know exactly what it is. The only thing is this guy here, the notch for this guy in the... I'm just going to match it. I know this is a little bit, little bit of cheating.
This is what you do sometimes. Sometimes you cheat a little bit. And that's going to be contour selection. We'll get this contour here. It's not going to be thin feature. And it's going to go only through this guy. And I'll make that through all. There we go. That's good. That works. And finally, we need to add in our threading. And this is going to be one of these spots where uh, we will do the threading as um, just a cut revolve. We don't have to do an actual thread on this thing. So we would go front plane, begin a sketch, orient the view. And we would say that we want to create a very basic thread here. Something like this. Make that for construction. Mirror that. When you got a picture, it's hard to window select. We can make this a 0 0.005 and we can define this angle here. Something that's going to be a little bit easier to see. It's all for illustration, so it's not, uh, it's not hypercritical or anything. We could say we want the depth of the thread to be. Just bring that in a little bit. And then we can create another center line here at the very middle. And we can say that this is going to be features revolved cut that gives us one and then we could take that revolved cut and we could say linear pattern and that's going to go in this direction and it'll have a you know a distance of something like that and then maybe before we do that linear pattern we would just throw a chamfer on the end here there's lots of ways that you can do this kind of stuff i'm not saying i always use this this particular method i'm just saying there this method will definitely work and give us the uh, illustration that we are hoping for so now we have something that looks like an instrument jack um you know, you can. I'll probably get in there and refine that a little bit more tonight. Uh, but uh, let's go 0 0.25 extrude cut, right mouse button. Mm, I actually don't want that through all. We'll just go up to surface and we'll go up to here. Just make sure that that hole is blasting through. What do we think, guys? I think that looks pretty good. Let's save that. Uh, let's do check in active document. And then let's take all that work and bury it in the body where no one is ever going to see it. Is the guy perspective turned on? Probably not how you want to work. So this guy and this guy should be able to get made it together now. Concentric. Yes. And I'm just trying to think if there's a nut. I don't think there's a nut in between these two. I think it's just on the outside. Can't remember. I got to look. There might be a washer that goes in between those two. But I'll just for now say that it uh, is, you know, directly on that inside surface. So right mouse button, select other, pick that inside surface, hold control, pick this surface here. Coincident. And there we go. There probably is a washer actually on the inside. But that is our instrument jack uh, hanging out in there, hanging out in the electronics cavity. That's what it looks like. It just kind of sets in there, and then the, uh, the instrument gets plugged in, or the cable gets plugged into that output jack. And, uh, and then we are going to be able to make some, some fun sounds on this bass guitar, and we're actually going to be able to hear them coming through an amplifier. And that's why it's important to have an instrument jack uh, that is wired correctly and working correctly. And I think that's where we're going to stop today. We went uh, almost two hours today, so very long uh, run today, but I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope you got a lot out of it. It's, uh, like I said at the beginning, the real theme throughout this series of videos is learning how to work with photographs. Uh, there's a lot of different scenarios where having a photograph can, can significantly reduce 
the overhead that you face. And in the case of this model, you know, we were able to use the photograph to create this shape, which would have been pretty difficult to just kind of eyeball up. You know, you saw all those little angles and things, and we're not even manufacturing this part. So we just need somebody to see it because we're creating a set of instructions or we're creating a, you know, a, a rendering for a company. You know, maybe we've been hired by a company to do a rendering. And so we're not manufacturing that part, but we do want it to look good when a customer sees that that model or sees that application, whatever it is, the rendering or the instructions or whatever it is. And so we are going to need to get in here and model this and we want it to look good. It doesn't have to be perfect from a manufacturing point of view, but it needs to be recognizable. Well, look at how much we were able to shortcut that process by working with a photo. We were able to get this kind of weird teardrop shape correct. We were able to get all the cuts in the in the wafer correct. We were able to get this, uh, this shape, this kind of weird bent shape correct. We were able to figure out what the threads look like and how many threads there are, all based off of those photographs so that's kind of the big takeaway that i want you guys to get from today is just to realize that working with photographs is, is a huge time saver it's a secret weapon it can uh, it can really help you get from point a to point b and it's not always about creating geometry that's going to be manufactured sometimes it's just about creating geometry that's recognizable or that looks good in a rendering or looks good in a set of instructions so I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, if you did, be sure to like, be sure to uh, buy a bunch of t-shirts, as many t-shirts as you can. Uh, remember that on the Too Tall Toby main page, there's a section uh, for support, financial support. If you want to uh, use a credit card and send me a, a donation, uh, send me some financial support. It is uh, always appreciated, useful, helps us keep the channel going. And, uh, and I thank you guys all so much for joining me today. Tomorrow is Friday, the last day of the week. What I'm going to be doing uh, tonight at some point, uh, if, if I can find the time, is I'll go through and I'll model these other two components. And that way tomorrow we can focus on creating the wires that go between these components. We're going to do some wire routing, not using SolidWorks routing, but just using sweeps and 3D sketches. And I'll show you guys how to do some wire routing. And so in order to do that, we really need these other two components. So the potentiometer, piece of cake, right? Take a picture from the top, create that wafer on the top, create some uh, revolves, boom, we're done with the potentiometer. The three-way switch, it's going to be a little bit more involved. Uh, and again, you have to decide on each project how detailed you really want to get with something like this. Uh, certainly the geometry that's going to be visible, the, the switch here that's sticking out the top, the little threads on the switch, this little cover plate, that I really want to get looking good. The, all the stuff down here at the bottom, we don't really care about, right? We just need the pots. Uh, we just need the poles to be there so we can run the wiring. So, you know, it's not really that important uh, for this application. So I'll probably just kind of fudge that stuff in there, get it to look recognizable. And, uh, you know, the, like I said, this potentiometer is a piece of cake. We already got that one. So we're pretty much good to go for the wiring once I get the, those two components created. I will follow the same workflow that I did today during the, uh, you know, during this presentation. Uh, so that's it. Raju, I don't have any, any suggestions for you, bro. Uh, good. You know, I think getting training with an actual instructor is, uh, the best thing you can do. I think, uh, you know, doing these live streams is good. I, I try to formulate this, this presentation in a way that you can follow it. But as far as, you know, just learning straight from a book, there's lots of books out there, but I don't have any recommendations because, uh, I, I haven't used them for that application. So I'm sorry, man. I wish I had more for you, but uh, I do appreciate the question. Uh, if you, you know, if anybody else in the chat has a good idea for a book for Raju, feel free to share that with him. And uh, guys, have a great rest of your, your Wednesday. We'll be back tomorrow, Thursday, for another live stream. And uh, if all goes according to plan, I'll have those other electronics uh, components in place and we will be ready to start wiring them together. And then it's pretty much uh, smooth sailing. We go up to the headstock. We, in the headstock, we need to create the machine tuners. So we come up here to the headstock, we create the tuning heads, uh, the cover plate for the truss rod, and then the strings. So we're probably winding down here, maybe like three or four more live streams. And, uh, you know, we're going to be out the door with this thing and then we're going to be ready to do a giveaway, a giveaway of the bass guitar. So we're going to mail this bass guitar out to somebody who wants it and they can start playing bass and get into a band and uh, be frustrated because no one could ever hear their instrument. I think when I was going over that stuff, I wasn't showing my screen. Sorry. <laughs>
Yeah, so all we got to do, you know, once we get the, the geometry down here for the electronics enclosure, uh, then all we got to do is come up here and uh, add in the machine heads and the cover plate for the truss rod and then the strings. So we're winding down here. I'll say probably, I'm going to guess like um, seven more episodes. That's going to be my guess. So I'm going to get, what are we, what's today's episode? Today's episode is the, what is today? The 10th, the 10th episode. We're on episode number 10, I think. So I'm going to say we're going to go to 17 and that's where we're going to finish. We're going to finish on 17. It's going to be my guess. We'll see if I'm correct. All right, guys. I'll see you guys tomorrow in the live stream. Same time. Hope you guys enjoyed this one. Bye-bye.